what fascinated me about him was not simply his collections, but that everybody thought that, um, that he was a terrible human being. And I thought, there must be something redeeming about him. And so I researched his printed book collection, thinking he owns his own press, he publishes a tremendous amount of material. Um, why did he do that? Was it for posterity? That sort of thing. Uh, and it, it turns out uh, I found nothing. Uh, it wasn't uh, a, a story of redemption. Um, but uh, he really was uh, a prolific printer. Um, and so you know, Yale has copies of almost everything that he printed. Um, and so we did a layout uh, to demonstrate you know, what happens in the 19th century when you can print. Um, and that's one half of the exhibit. And then the second half of the exhibit is related to uh, medieval manuscripts, uh, some that he collected, uh, and some in particular that were forged. Uh, supposedly ancient materials that were not. It's, I think, important to note that while Phillips did collect beautiful medieval manuscripts, and there's a ninth century copy of the Capitularies of Charlemagne in there, there are beautiful illuminated manuscripts from the Renaissance. What really fascinated me about Phillips as a collector was that he also wanted to collect what were considered unimportant manuscripts in his own day. He says that he was inspired to start collecting parchment by seeing wagon loads of it being brought to glue makers. A lot of parchment in the 19th century was just destroyed. No one was interested in small contracts, little scraps of parchment explaining different land usages, and he collected all that. He collected thousands upon thousands of documents that reveal a great deal about social history and reveal a great deal about ordinary people. And he was very much aware he was doing that. He also collected historical manuscripts right up to his own day. The latest item in the case upstairs is an 1825 list of Italians receiving relief aid in London from refugees from the wars. Well, one of the things that's, that's fascinating to me is um, to find out how European books in particular end up in American collections. Uh, we're not a country that obviously has any uh, history uh, with these documents, and because Phillips was such a difficult individual, uh, he was unable to sell his books in mass to the British Library. And so what happened is after his death, they, uh, they were dispersed, they went everywhere. And American institutions benefited from that. Um, and so we uh, were able to purchase um, and are still able to purchase Phillips manuscripts uh, that have been floating around. And so it's interesting to see that even though we don't have this deep history, uh, because these objects came for sale in the 20th century, we did acquire a lot of them. And we would like people to, to be able to see that. Um, and it's also fun to get inside the mind of somebody who literally, um, that all he cared about were his books, that he abandoned family, uh, he abandoned friends, um, his books were very well taken care of. Uh, and just to see that sort of uh, personality uh, from the 19th century. What I could have that I hope people get a sense of is that the history we have, and the history we have to study, is very much a product in some ways of the decisions of individuals. If Phillips had not existed, at least tens of thousands of these manuscripts would not have come down here. That you can look at the cases and see this is what one person saved. And that becomes, in a way, what we see as history. Those Italian refugees are probably not documented anywhere else. You know, the land records from the 14th century that he collected, we would not know much about farming practices in the 14th century without that kind of document. So bibliomaniacs do shape history because what they keep is what we have.